Okay, today we're talking about the presidency of Richard Nixon. And if you remember, he'd been vice president from 1952 until 1960. And then he lost the election uh, against John Fitzgerald Kennedy. So he comes back and runs in 1968. He um, has to resign in his second term due to a, a scandal called Watergate, which we'll talk more about. But he's a very consequential president. First of all, he brings in this idea called new conservatism. And some think that he's really the beginning of a modern conservative backswing um, against the New Deal and Great Society programs that has moved on into today, kind of a rebirth of conservatism. Um, he, like modern conservatives, believed that the federal government was large, bureaucratic, and slow and wasteful, and that we wanted to devolve power down to the states. Federalism is the division of power between the state governments and the national government. And typically, power had been moving up to the national government from the states, and he wanted to reverse that, and he wanted to bring power from the national government to the states and decrease, make the federal government smaller, which was going against the trends of the past. So um, as a result, he had this idea called revenue sharing, which governors loved. It was the idea that the federal government should just give money to the states and let the states decide how best to spend it. Now, Democrats and people who opposed this felt that the states couldn't always be trusted particularly in terms of spending money equitably in terms of um, civil rights or race or um, those kinds of things. So the, the uh, Democrats opposed this idea, but it was a kind of a classic Republican idea, uh, capital R Republican Party idea to provide more money to the states and the states would best know how to spend it in a way that would best meet the, need, the needs of their population. Okay. Um, Nixon was also the first person who... Um, criticized welfare. He thought that it was being abused and that we needed to add a work requirement. Uh, he could not get Congress to go along with him on this. Um, and so it was a major initiative of his domestic agenda that did not pass. This actually will be accomplished later, ironically, by a Democrat, by Bill Clinton in 1995. Um, but it was first initiated by President Nixon and is kind of an example of how he thought that some government programs had grown too large, inefficient, and were wasting money. Now, there are some things he does in terms of negotiating a budget with Congress that are kind of surprising. The reason is he was working with a Democratic Congress. And so at first, he tries to really kind of meet them in the middle to get some things they want so he can get some things he wants. And so he does some things that are a little surprising for a conservative Republican. For example, um, he expands Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and he made it easier to get food stamps. Um, later, though, his relationship with Congress kind of sours, and they get in arguments about certain programs that he does not like. And one thing he innovates is that if he doesn't like a law and, um, or a program that's been established, he innovates this idea called impounding. He just basically refuses to write the checks that will fund and carry out those programs. It's a and an early example of his idea of kind of an imperial presidency where sometimes the president can kind of be above the law, um, almost Jacksonian in, in a certain way. And so he just starts withholding this money from over 100 federal programs that he disagrees with or thinks are wasteful and claims that that is in the best interest of the nation because um, these programs are inefficient. Eventually, the Supreme Court rules that this is unconstitutional um, but it was kind of a, a, a showdown that was going on between the two branches of government. Nixon really felt like uh, that the hippies and anti-war demonstrators and civil rights, Black Panther Party members, those kinds of people, that they had kind of hogged the spotlight during the 1960s and people thought that they made up the majority. But he felt that his election really indicated that, no, that's not what's going on. The majority of Americans actually do want his policies and that they believe in law and order. Um, and so he calls this the idea of the silent majority, that there's a silent majority of Americans out there who actually don't like the way things are and they want greater enforcement of law. So the silent majority idea was that um, most people actually do support the war in Vietnam and that they think we should be fighting to contain communism in Vietnam and that we certainly shouldn't leave Vietnam in a way that dishonors our country and the commitments we made there. Um, also, he said that he felt that people really wanted law enforcement to deal forcefully with people who were breaking the law, using drugs, causing public disorder, unrest, protest, those kinds of things. So 
he thought that um, what he needed to do is kind of make a list of people who were um, a threat to the establishment and law and order. And he called this the enemies list. Uh, these were those student protesters, Black Panthers, um, some civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King, um, and hippies, hippie types, that he started making a list of them and using the FBI kind of like his own personal police force. And they started doing all kinds of kind of extra legal or illegal things, sometimes legal, but oftentimes not, that involve things like wiretapping their phones or infiltrating their groups with plainclothes FBI agents and um, searching their offices. These kinds of tactics were used, kind of like the Palmer raids in the 1920s when we feared communism um, and the attorney general was acting illegally to do that. This is kind of the modern version of that. And the idea was that we were just trying to bring law and order back into the country and that these people were trying to destabilize the country and perhaps extraordinary measures needed to be taken to stop that. Nixon also was the first president who realized there was a huge opportunity to bring white Southerners into the Republican Party. White Southerners had typically been Democrats. If you remember when Truman came out for desegregating the armed forces, the, the white Southerners kind of realized they'd lost their party. They formed the Dixiecrats, but the Dixiecrats didn't really ever get elected in large numbers. Nixon wins over white Southerners by trying to slow down desegregation of schools. Now, it had been said in Brown versus Board in 1954 that you could not segregate schools. The catch is now that they are claiming that um, just going to the school closest to your house is really not good enough because we tended to segregate our neighborhoods. Now, in 1971, they had ruled that white students from the suburbs needed to be bused into black schools downtown and black students from downtowns needed to be bused to the suburban schools. And this is what um, Charlotte City School, Charlotte Public Schools did, for example. This was kind of peeling back um, and revealing the kind of um, subtle racism that existed in the North. And it was working class white people in the North that just kind of went crazy over this. Um, there were riots and stabbings um, in Boston, for example, a lot of uh, in Chicago, Detroit, kind of working class uh, neighborhoods just went ballistic over this. And he won over a lot of uh, those people through opposing this busing um, requirement and trying to slow it down. He also was able to um, change the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, since Eisenhower, had been very liberal. It had been called the Warren Court. And you don't need to remember the specific names of these four justices, but he did appoint four men to the Supreme Court that helped turn the tide of the Warren Court and made the Supreme Court more conservative and more likely to back law enforcement and, um, and kind of pull back some of the uh, protections for the accused. That had been the kind of hallmark of the Warren Court. In terms of foreign policy, Nixon was just revolutionary. He introduced this idea that we don't need to fight communism everywhere and we don't need to isolate and ignore communist countries just because they're communist. Instead, he suggested that we need to think about power and that if a country is powerful, we need to pay attention to it, even if it's communist. And just because a country is communist doesn't mean it's important. Um, and that it was really about power. So ironically, he actually made, even though he was a huge Cold Warrior um, earlier in his career, he actually was able to ease Cold War tensions by creating new diplomatic relationships with communist countries. For example, he recognized that Taiwan was not China, that China was China. He said we should give the UN Security Council seat to China, and he actually went to China, visited them, and here they are on the Great Wall. This was just a revolutionary change in our foreign policy ever since the Communist Revolution in China in the 1950s. He also visited the Soviet Union, and we pounded out a treaty called the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks Treaty that limited our nuclear weapons for the first time. So that was a very significant change in our foreign policy, kind of making more peace with communist countries. Because again, he said they're powerful, important, we can trade with them, we can make um, uh, gains through our association with them. The next um, thing he did is he got us out of Vietnam. It was called Peace with Honor. And we've already talked about that when we talked about um, uh, the end of Vietnam. So. All right, the major thing that will bring a close to the Nixon era is the Watergate scandal. And I'm gonna talk more about this in class at length and kind of act it out for you to make it a little clearer. But basically, I'll just hit the, the highlights here and then we'll return to it in class. 
1972, he was afraid he wasn't going to get reelected, which was kind of irrational because his polling numbers were very, very good. So um, he had some of his supporters were called Creep, the Committee to Reelect the President. They broke into his opponent's headquarters. We don't know for sure if Nixon, we don't think he knew about the break-in ahead of time, but we do know that afterwards he tried to help clear it, tried to help cover it up, which is obstruction of justice. Um, he said he didn't know anything about it, and um, a secret source that we'll talk more about, who was in the CIA, his name at the time was Mark Felt, but no one knew who he was. He stayed anonymous. Uh, he was a CIA operative who was mad that the president was lying and had called the CIA off of the investigation of the burglary um, into the office. And so he started calling these two men, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, and they started reporting on the robbery. And um, eventually the Senate decides to hold hearings about it, and it's revealed that all of the president's conversations in the White House are on audio tape. So the Senate simply asked the president to turn over the audio tapes. He says that he doesn't have to turn over these audio tapes because he has something called executive privilege. And the whole thing goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says in U.S. versus Nixon that he does need to hand over the tapes. And eventually um, he got overwhelmed trying to delete and edit the tapes. And eventually it became, uh, two things became clear. One is that the president is not the nice guy he put forth in public and that he was actually crude and rude and profane and um, paranoid to some degree. But also that he had tried to help cover up the break-in. And so the House of Representatives starts to draw up um, impeachment charges. They start to uh, charge him with obstruction of justice and um, other charges, seven in total. And he realizes that the evidence is going to be clear, and so he resigns before he can be impeached. His vice president had also had to resign. His name was Spiro Agnew because he had been accepting bribes. And so before Nixon resigned, he had appointed a new vice president, and that vice president's name was Gerald Ford. And so Ford becomes president having never been elected to the vice presidency or the presidency. So it's a very tumultuous time in American history, as you can imagine. Our president has resigned. We've lost the Vietnam War. Um, so his presidency ends very badly. And um, that's the kind of lasting impression a lot of people have and don't remember the important contributions he made in foreign policy, um, especially. So that's the rundown of the Nixon presidency. We'll uh, meet together in class, see if you have any questions before uh, we move on. Thanks.